I'm very excited for this particular conversation, especially kind of through the lens of not only that volatility in crypto, but kind of it seems, I mean, I was just reading about a Solana hack. There was a bridge hack, a, a lot of like, I guess, security, privacy. And here, even with my audience, I get questions a lot of like, where should we go? What's the best way to protect ourselves? So I'd love to talk about that crypto as a whole. But I, maybe the best way to get this started is if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit about your background, you're very well known in the crypto space. So it's definitely a privilege. Everyone, please listen up. But beyond that, if we could kind of get into your opinion of just the overall market right now, what's going on with Fed, interest rates, inflation. Um, but I think this is going to be a very intriguing conversation, to say the least. We've got a lot of topics uh, to cover. Yeah, so to start off with a little bit about my background, I got into crypto, started making videos about it like 2013, and I was working at the New York Bitcoin Center at the time. And it was a very different place to what it is now. It was very much about the ethos of, you know, the Federal Reserve is doing crazy things with the money mm. supply. We don't want a repeat of what happened in 08 when you had all these TARP bailouts and you had just like corporate bailouts and basically taxpayer money going to a bunch of the, the the pockets of a, of a bunch of people who uh, couldn't manage their businesses. And so it was this idea of, well, this is this is freedom. This is monetary freedom because we now have an alternative that can't be shut down. So that's sort of the, the era that I came into it in. And then everything exploded and we realized how cool this space could be. <laughs> and suddenly you start to get a hint of the potential when you have programmable money and suddenly you have all these cool smart contracts and you have this whole DeFi world explode and you have NFTs and you have everything just go crazy. And I think what we're seeing now is sort of a reversion back to like a little reminder to say, hey guys, this is the point because the economy is going crazy and suddenly people are seeing like the real value of crypto again. And, you know, I mean, we've, we've discovered all kinds of values in crypto. It isn't just you know, a monetary haven in case the mm. Federal Reserve tries to inflate away all of your savings. There are all kinds of tools, but it's really important because of that inflation. So if we take a step back, we look at what's happening in the macro economy right now, we look at the fact that the Fed just last week increased uh, the interest rates by 75 basis points again. So they, they did that last month as well. And that was the biggest hike since 1994 when you had the bond crisis. And so you're starting to see like some real red flags in the economy, some danger signs that like when the Fed raises interest rates, I'm not sure if your your audience is like mm. diving into the nerdy hole that is macroeconomics, but it's kind of like, it's my, I love being there because I think that it's something that affects all of us. And it a lot of people don't realize that it affects all of us. So, you know, when the Fed raises interest rates, suddenly you've got this credit crunch and uh, the economy takes a dive, which is what we're seeing. And obviously crypto plays a part in that. It's not an isolated economy. Mm -hmm. People have their assets in a whole bunch of things. So they have it in crypto and they have it in the housing market and they have it in stocks and bonds and all of that. Um, and so we're seeing everything kind of take a dive right now. But what's exciting to me is that all of the you know economic crises we've had in the past, we haven't had an alternative. It's kind of like the Federal Reserve saying, well, you know, good luck trying another system because US dollar is the only thing you can really use. And now we have this global money that people can escape to. So although markets are correlated, and this leads me on to what you asked about, like predictions for the future. Although markets are correlated, although people have assets across all of these different uh, like diversified asset pools, um, I think that the underlying idea that now people have a choice that they can move to an alternative money if they don't like what's happening uh, in terms of Federal Reserve policies, like it, <laughs> the astronomical money printing that has been going on uh, over the last few years, you know, people can opt out now and they couldn't before. And that's really exciting. And so like we've always had gold and all that. But yeah, try sending gold to your Amazon, you know, seller when you try to buy something on the internet. It's just not going to happen. But mm -hmm. these days we have all kinds of tools that actually allow you to spend crypto anywhere you want. So if someone wants to opt out, they can. I think that the population's only just waking up to this. I think the economy is going to get worse and I think more people are going to wake up. So of course there's volatility, you know, as we get more liquidity in the crypto market, uh, I think that will start to, uh, to even out. But honestly, I think that we're still at this precipice of a giant boom because people don't realize yet that they have a choice. You and I do, mm -hmm. all of your audience does, but most people don't. And that's what's most exciting about this world. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's so many amazing things to unpack right there, but off the most recent thing you said, 
I feel that because I'm sure we've all seen those graphs of the Bitcoin adoption rate also in line with the internet. And it's a it, on a logarithmic scale, it's just ripping from the bottom left to the top right. And yes, do I think every crypto project's gonna succeed? No, I think some are scams and some are doomed to fail. But if we're just talking about the core ones such as Bitcoin, it's clearly a commodity. And I know we're gonna talk about some regulation and SEC stuff later on, but we know the SEC is not gonna ruin Bitcoin, at least not the way that they could potentially ruin other ones. But right now, I mean, this is the first full Fed cycle that I've been paying attention to it. Like in college, I remember like reading about it, like, okay, like, why does that really matter? I'm not going to get a mortgage. It seemed a little bit too far from me. But even for anyone who's maybe listening to this right now, and you're like, wait, why should I care about this? What's going on? Just look at the charts from 2021 to 2022, uh, whether it's the crypto chart or whether it's the equity chart or both of them. When the Fed is supporting you, when they're being as dovish as they possibly can, you're ripping from the bottom left to the top right. Just it's backstopping everything. And then what changed in January was the Fed said they're going from quantitative easing to quantitative tightening. So right there, like when we started to sell off and we've been selling off at one point, we were in a bear market. Crypto's obviously been experiencing crypto winter. That's the power of the Fed right there. And I was kind of, um, I guess, thinking about this a little bit yesterday. I would love to get your talk of the craziest thing in the U.S. is we don't elect these people. We elect the people who end up picking them, but that's so much power. And then when you think about the fact that they're not elected, many of them in March, right before they hit us with quantitative easing, they went from all bonds to stock. Like they were front running their own decision. And then at the top of this year, around January, February, they're like, ah, oh, because of ethics reasons, we're going to sell out. And then they ran the market down and these people aren't elected. It's just so, so crazy. So I know certain people like get into the discussion of like, yes, we all agree. Maybe the Fed's doing something and you need, I don't know, maybe an external way to store your value. And to me, I don't know if Bitcoin in the long run is going to be the ultimate winner, but I would argue right now it's clearly the front runner in that competition. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's tough to say, right? Because if you look historically, Bitcoin wasn't the first alternative money. There have been so many others. There've been alternative digital monies and the government systematically has gone and shut them down because they can, because Bitcoin was the first iteration of a digital money that was decentralized, that didn't have a CEO that you could throw in jail or a server you could unplug or, you know, a central hub that you could just, you know, put a ban on and mm -hmm. say like, no one use the central hub. It's decentralized, it's a decentralized phenomenon so they couldn't shut it down. So I think that, I mean, the tables have turned and people haven't really wrapped their heads around it. It's interesting that you say you don't know what will be the ultimate winner. Uh, I think none of us do. But mm. yeah, you're right. Bitcoin has a really good shot because this is the first time, like, I mean, so Scott Stornetta, he uh, has four of the eight citations in the white paper, mm -hmm. right? He was the one who in invented the early blockchain. And he had this great quip where he says, yeah, Bitcoin, it, you know, you had a lot of cypherpunks trying to create alternative money and they kept getting shut down. And then you had Bitcoin and it was the first one to just get the ball over the net. So it yeah. wasn't ideal, but it was so much better. It was the first one to succeed. And having, uh, you know, first mover advantage has been huge for Bitcoin. But also, you know, our imaginations are now going wild with what's possible. And it, I think, I mean, I foresee a world where we have so many different niche markets with slightly different use cases. I mean, there's a reason why I have a Patreon as well as a PayPal. PayPal mm -hmm. also does recurring pa purchases. So why do I need two platforms that do like tiny, tiny different things? Why do mm -hmm. I need a Twitter account and a Facebook account when Facebook's basically the same? I can even write more words. It's because tailoring products that we use very, very slightly to specific niches is powerful. It, there is this market, <clears throat> pardon me, market demand for that. And I think that what we're seeing now is crypto start to find their little niche market demands. You have people mm -hmm. who are like, okay, well, I want this and it's digital gold, but I want this other thing and it's digital gold, but it also has this other little tweak that I can use. And then I have this other thing that was really good for smart contracts. And yeah, I could use it for these other things as well, but you know, I just want to focus on the smart contracts. This one's great for NFT, this one's great for gaming. You know, we, we're kind of building out this space with these tiny little niches. So while I don't know which one is going to win out, I don't know that one is going to win out either. Mm -hmm. And I don't see why they should. 
And just one more thing on that point. I mean, you look at the history of money and people always say, well, there's always going to be one money because there's network effect in money and we only have to, you know, we, we can only accept one as a society. And it's just not true uh, because historically you had uh, gold and silver who in the free market were being traded you know, simultaneously and the market just, you know, found a, an equilibrium for that. Government ruined it when they came in and they added that bimetallism standard. But, um, but like traditionally you had physical limitations as to why you had to curtail the number of assets you traded with people because I couldn't fit in my pocket you know going to the town market copper and silver and gold and yeah. seashells and salt and whatever else you know was being accepted as money so society kind of converges what we have now is a digital phenomenon that has no physical restrictions so in my wallet I don't need to have just one thing I can have Zcash and Monero and I can have you know rail and I can have all like Ethereum and Bitcoin and, and whatever else, Dogecoin, I can have some some dumb token that's like Naomi coin or whatever, you know, and it doesn't matter because our wallets can just like seamlessly move these around under the hood. And like, we're moving into uncharted territory where any of that stuff could just become the norm. And you may not even know what currency you're paying with. It may just be all happening under the hood in your wallet being determined by certain algorithms that can decide the best exchange rate at the time. You know, like it's uncharted territory, but it's exciting. And as you said, you know, Bitcoin is kind of a savior at the moment. Like it's something that people are looking to as a place for their assets and short term, looking pretty good. Long term, we have no idea. I, I agree completely. You know, we have all of these options now and it's really exciting. Yeah, I mean, I think you're bringing up some very valid points of, I, I wouldn't identify as like a Bitcoin maximalist personally. Um, I do maybe feel more comfortable with it, but that's just through the lens of the SEC. But uh, you bring up a point of we have all these different things and it's just a little bit of a customized difference for trying to get this done trying to get that done now does that mean that we're going to need thousands and thousands of them no not really but i also don't think that it's just a solution where there's one thing um and with that i mean kind of getting into the world of the sec and all of that I know that you've been personally paying close attention and I believe you also upload your content onto Odyssey. And for those of you who don't know, it's kind of a almost like a Web3 crypto way to get it. And it has like the library protocol. Could you kind of explain, I guess, first of all, your decision to go on Odyssey on top of YouTube and other social media and what the current case is with the SEC and really LBRY? Sure. So I got involved in library in 2017. So I was previously a producer for John Stossel and he did a piece covering this like decentralized YouTube is what they were kind of billing themselves as uh, because there was a situation where universities started to pull their free online content um, off the internet. It used to, you know, traditionally like MIT, for example, would have all of their lectures available and anyone could watch them. Then um, they had to pull them because they got complaints that because they weren't you know correct closed captioning etc it wasn't available to any everyone so it couldn't be available to anyone so they had to pull it and so you had people say like this is you know devastating this should be available to people and uh and so they started to just mirror all of these lectures on this unknown platform called library which is basically a decentralized network you could store film there which is what they're most well known for but you could also store files and and whatever else you want to store in this decentralized manner. And so the idea was that they would put up all of these lectures in a way that no one could ever take down because it's decentralized and you have like little bits stored all over the place. It's kind of like if you know how IPFS works, it's like a similar type of thing, but library uses its own standard uh, for um, you know, distributing these files. And then, you know, I, I got involved then, 2017. I set up an account. I linked my YouTube account. I was like, okay, I'll just mirror it. There was li there's literally a button you can press that says, like, just link all my stuff. So I forgot about it, and I kept uploading onto YouTube, and everything that I uploaded onto YouTube would just get automatically populated on Library. Super okay. convenient. Fast forward, it's like 2020, and one of my friends is like, Naomi, you should probably look on uh, on library because it's gone gangbusters and I looked on there and my, my stuff is like one of the top channels there and wow. they have what it's like 20 million uh, active users like a day or something crazy like like it's like no it's like 2 million active users a day 20 million a month or something like that like this, this wow. is a huge platform with a lot of engagement so I dug in because I'm very interested in new technology and this was a way to not only put up you know, content that couldn't be censored, 
seeing a lot of censorship for better or worse. We could have that debate another time, but it's a way for me to be sustainable as a channel because mm -hmm. the LBC token was something that I get rewarded with when I watch a video. Um, I get tips. I can use it to give my channel more visibility. Uh, I, you know, there are all of these use cases in this world. And so it's not like YouTube where it kind of picks and uh, mm -hmm. picks the winners and losers and, you know, no, you get the algorithm, but you don't because <laughs> I don't like your content and I've got this hidden number attached to your channel that says no they're, they're a bad yeah. channel like there's none of that on odyssey um and let me explain because i've just used the word odyssey we've been talking about libraries so library is the decentralized protocol it's basically an app that you download and you can use it to interface with the library uh, protocol uh, but they realize that having a centralized front end is also helpful for new people to get involved so they created first of all library.tv years ago it's been deprecated since then now they have odyssey which is kind of like they also have odyssey servers they upload things to theirs it makes things a lot faster i personally use the library app i like you know going from the decentralized end and doing stuff there but library the Odyssey is like a website you can go to where you can see all the videos easily. You can, you know, interact with it uh, without having to download the app and kind of, you know, understanding anything on the back end. So that's kind of a background on this project. Now, fast forward, like about four years ago now, uh, the SEC decided that they are going to go after crypto in general. Mm -hmm. And they're just like, no, this is a world we need to shut down. So in private for three years, Library Foundation, which is the foundation that's responsible for creating this protocol, they've been in a battle with the SEC. No one knew about it because they weren't allowed to talk about it. They were you know, under gag orders and whatnot, privately negotiating with the SEC. Uh. They offered them settlements. They offered them all kinds of things. They were just like, listen, like this is a, this is a, a tool that has use case on our platform, it literally fuels the entire ecosystem. LBC is not a security. It's literally the thing that makes our decentralized video platform work. The SEC was like, no, no, no. Finally, they unveiled a lawsuit about a year ago. And so Library went public with this and they started, um, and maybe it was maybe it was a year and a half. I'm, you know, it's a, all, all a blur in the crypto world. Um, but then they announced some pretty shocking things. Now, the reason why the library case has uh, caught my attention so heavily is because if the SEC wins their case about library, they've set a precedent to go after every single crypto, basically, apart from Bitcoin. That includes Ethereum, right? It's huge. And maybe we can detail some of those specific claims that they're making about why LBC is a security. So one, they're saying that, well, because there are people continuing to work on it. You know, it's not a finished product, therefore it's a security. I don't know a tech product where people aren't continuing <laughs> to work on it. That's yeah. literally how tech works. You know, you, they also say that because and this was shocking. So they just let me let me rewind a little bit. Two weeks ago, they had their hearing for this trial. Uh, yeah. And I'm kind of involved with this because I was a witness for uh, library basically saying, hey, I use this platform. It's really useful to me. Oh. Uh, please don't destroy it. Um, and so a couple of weeks ago, they had this hearing and it was basically a hearing to see whether there's going to be a summary judgment on this or whether it's going to go to trial. And the ruling that we should hear about this somewhere within the next two to six weeks, I think, about which way the judge is going to go. So you were um, in the SEC case. Sorry to interrupt, but like you were there like yeah, yeah. talking with the library. Like so that has I, was, to be I just wrote um, like a statement for them. It okay. turns out that they didn't actually call me in. Uh, I didn't uh. take the stand or anything and the SEC didn't d uh, depose me after all. Um, but I had to like deal with them and all the subpoenas and all of that. Like it's, uh, wow. it's uh, such a nightmare. They like, be nerve wracking. Imagine what, what library is going through, like the millions and millions and millions of dollars that they've spent on legal fees rather than just improving their very valuable service. Mm -hmm. Like it breaks my heart, honestly. But um, so they they uh, were saying also in this document that it is a bombshell statement from the SEC in this hearing where they said utility doesn't matter. So the judge was kind of trying to get them to clarify their stance. And it's like, well, you know, what if like 75% of people who use the library platform protocol, um, they're doing it for utility purposes? What if they're content creators who just want to use it and they're not buying this for an investment purpose? And the SEC said, doesn't matter. And then the, they kind of pushed them. They're like, so what if like 99% of people are using this for the utility? And the SEC said, utility doesn't matter. So they're arguing that if like a handful of people 
decide to take a product and, and it has you know, fluctuating value on the open market, that is a security. Like what? If I decide, you know, go to a jewelry store and buy a bracelet and then that has fluctuating value on the open market, is that now a security? Like a Chuck E. Cheese tokens, a security? Like what they have said is that every crypto is a security. So this is why this case is so important because they're about to make this decision about whether all cryptos are gonna be considered securities, which means that if you wanna you know, offer these to people in the United States, you have to you know, apply to the SEC and you have to go through uh, all of those hurdles or people just have to offer it only to accredited investors. Where we go back to this archaic system where you created this complete inequality in society. Like the whole idea of an accredited investor is, oh, well, you're richer, therefore you probably know more about this. Therefore you're allowed to have these investment opportunities that poor people can't. And yeah. it's like, what? You're literally taking away these investment opportunities from, from uh, the average people because they're not rich enough. And so what the SEC wants to do is like, you know, say, yep, let's get back to that. That was a better system. Like, wow. I mean, this whole thing, is crazy and scary. Uh, Jeremy Kaufman, the CEO of Library um, you know, Foundation, he put up such a great fight and is just kind of um, uncovering the hypocrisy the whole way. And we'll see what happens. But that's in a nutshell, like where we're at with this. A lot of people aren't paying attention. The XRP crowd started to pay attention because they realized that this is the case that's going to set the precedent. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, this is going to affect everything. Um, but it's just, yeah, it, it, this is going to be a big turning point and see whether or not the United States is going to continue to be a hub for the crypto space or whether it's all just going to move offshore. So with the library protocol and even XRP, and we're talking about Ripple, is the SEC's position the same thing if they just are failing the Howey test? Like, is that the same overall TLDR for like the similarities between the two? So that's it. So the Howey test has like these four prongs and essentially, it, and it could, it doesn't have to, you know, uh, uh, get a tick on every single one of mm -hmm. those prongs. Um, now, the SEC is focusing in right now on one of them and it's like, well, a, a couple of them. One of them is the decentralized nature of it. Um, and, uh, you know, they're saying like people are continuing to work on this. Therefore, it's still a security. These people are too central you know, to the process. And it's like this is like an open source dev community like what are you even talking about there are no barriers to entry anyone could come in and you know spin up their own front end or whatever like contribute to the code so they're, they're basically honing in on these uh certain two prongs of the howie test that are their real focus and um you know i it's such an archaic law this needs to be revisited the sec currently and hester purse sec commissioner has been great on this because she's pointing out how first of all we need the safe heart we need to have like obviously you you can't just have a decentralized project come you know just appear right mm -hmm. it's like things start from someone so you can't just say everything is not decentralized because it started from a few people developing it or whatever so Hester Peirce has said listen let's have a safe harbor rule let's like carve out this area of space maybe it's a year or a couple of years or whatever and say like in good faith if you're actively trying to work towards a more decentralized centralized nature for your protocol, then, you know, it's, it, you get a free pass. Um, the SEC has just kind of like shut that idea down over and over. They do not want anyone getting a free pass uh, in the crypto world. Um, but as the person has also pointed out the hypocrisy, like there was a case with, uh, I think it was Pat, Yes, don't hold me to that, uh, where she slammed the SEC. It was basically a ruling that said that this exchange was selling unregistered securities and there was a settlement. And in that settlement, the SEC provided no clarity about which tokens were actually securities or not. And they <laughs> refused to give any guidance along the way. H Hestifer slammed them and said, listen, you guys need to like provide some guidelines because the crypto space, like, I mean, you're stifling innovation. You're not letting them know how to do this stuff legally and it's not okay. And in this settlement, you didn't even provide any clarity there. Like, this is crazy. How are people meant to know what you consider a security or not? Because you're using these very like, you know, abstract uh, re-evaluations of what the hell we test men in, in a new paradigm where everything's digital and it's a completely different situation. People don't know what you're, what you're thinking, what your rules are. 
and the, and the library team in particular, they tried for years to, they, they went to the SEC and said, how do we do this legally? And the SEC told them over and over again, we cannot tell you how to do it legally. All we can tell you is that you're now doing it illegally. And they're like, well, help <laughs> us here. You know, all this rhetoric from, from Gary Gensler about come in and talk to us. We're very reasonable. We just want to yeah. help. They went in and talked to them repeatedly and, you know, and said, please tell us how to do this legally. And they kept telling, being told, no, we can't tell we you know. how to do it legally. It's just insane. That's interesting. We can only tell you if it's illegal, but we don't really know about <laughs> the legality. That's interesting. Okay. Um, you, so you brought up Hester, and she, to me, is kind of an intriguing character because when I talk to people, if they like her, I know they're coming from a crypto background because she, in both of these, and this is the common vein of uh, more of a libertarian take of like, let's just not get in the way. Um, so people from crypto very, very much like it, but then a lot of retail from the equities world, well, she applies that same mantra and then there's, I guess, some discontent, if you will, in the world of like market making and payment for order flow. And that's very much on the equity side of thing. But I just find it like, I'm sure right now in chat and people watching this, they're feeling, well, half of them, when you said has sort of the crypto, like, oh no, we like her. And then the other half was like, ah, we don't know about that. <laughs> but um, in terms of, I guess, Gary Gensler, and this is obviously just your opinion, uh, unless you've had a direct conversation with him, which would be interesting. But do you think he's there in terms of trying to support crypto? Do you think he has like the crypto spheres back, like as an individual? Because I know there's, it's hard to separate the guy from like the institution that he's currently the head of. But like, what's your opinion on him? I think he's on a power trip. I think he's a power hungry politician who wants to completely take control of the entire crypto space because it's an incredibly lucrative industry. There are currently battles within government between the you know CFTC and, and uh, SEC about like who's going to control this. Are these securities? Are these commodities? They're battling this out right now uh, for jurisdiction and the SEC is going hard. They want this to be their wheelhouse. This, I mean, this is going to mean bigger salaries and bigger budgets mm -hmm. and bigger teams. And it's just going to mean like more control control the I mean gosh I have such a low regard for politicians in general I am I, I am so tired of them infantilizing the population that they're meant to serve and telling them you know we know better and we're going to make your decisions for you I'm sorry but I think individuals are smart and can make their own decisions right um and I think that the SEC coming in and telling people you know you're not rich enough to to be able to <laughs> invest in this and you're not smart enough to make these choices and like how about the SEC migrate to like just being a tick of approval, right? I'm sure people yeah. could benefit from that. Rather than a mandate, like you can't operate unless the SEC has said otherwise, how about you just have it like a, as a stamp so people can make their own choice and say, well, the SEC hasn't stamped this and an individual can then say, okay, well, they haven't stamped it, but you know, I have a good feeling I'm gonna take a risk anyway. That's the way it should be with mm -hmm. individuals being able to make their own choices. And, you know, then the SEC is helping people because they're just kind of, you know, doing research into it and all this, and, uh, and get, letting people know how they feel. The current situation is the opposite of that. It's a bunch of people who knew nothing about crypto, who are not developers, who are the least well-informed people about how this stuff actually worked, making choices about what is a good thing and what isn't a good thing. Like, I'm sorry, but I work full time in this space and I have trouble figuring that out sometimes. I know mm. developers who are so caught up just on their own project that they have no idea what's going on in the rest of the crypto world. And you're saying that some politician with no background background in any of this is going to be the one to make the best choices for all of us like that it's a completely ludicrous idea so we need to completely re-envision you know the SEC's role in all of this again I'm I'm going to trigger some of your your viewers right now I'm going to mention Hester Peirce's name again the reason why you should give her a fair chance uh, if she's uh, come down hard on something that's important to you give her a fair chance because one principle that she stands by that i think is very very important for a free society is that the sec shouldn't be making investment decisions for individuals uh, they should be looking at projects and seeing whether or not those projects are transparent that's actually their mandate and what the sec is now pivoting to is an enforcement agency and actually deciding you know what people are and are not allowed to participate in and that's a very controlling 
uh, situation. It's a slippery slope there. I don't think any of us as individuals want our choices to be curtailed. Um, so what as, you know, Hester has been good at is is saying, you know, this people people should like the SEC should not be making these choices for you. It should just be making sure that the companies are being above board and not like, engaging in fraudulent activity or fraudulent misrepresentation. All of that stuff's important, and that's what we should focus on. And I I agree with her there. I I just don't think that that the SEC should be making choices for people. I think that if they're going to be regulating this industry, it should just be to make sure that people are being honest in the way they present their products and that it's being marketed correctly um, and that there's no fraud involved with that. And then cut that off. That's it. Full so stop. <laughs> going off the back of that, though, would you maybe just a little bit to play devil's advocate? Do you think the SEC had a place in kind of the whole Voyager or Celsius or Luna debacle? Because it seems like you're going for like, hey, they they have a time and a place of just like make sure you're basically not lying. But maybe to get a little bit more specific, Voyager flaunted as being diverse when in reality, half of their money was with 3AC and then that blew up. Like that's not really diversification in any way. So do you think the SEC should have been like involved in that particular process or still would you have drawn the line somewhere else? Well, I really dislike the SEC, uh, but I do think that there may have been fraud involved with some of these things that have happened. Mm -hmm. When you have a company saying that they're hedging their assets and everything is over collateralized, and if you're just taking out a loan, that loan is over collateralized, and like I mean, and then they're not doing it. I think that's a case of fraud, and I do think that someone needs to be held accountable, whether it's the SEC getting involved with this or someone else, like you know, whatever. The government is a big bureaucratic nightmare they can figure it out but I do think that these are situations where you know someone should be held accountable if they've misrepresented what consumers are actually getting on the other end if someone is saying that you know this is a diversified portfolio and it's not I think that's an issue if someone is saying that all of these loans are over collateralized that it's safe and it's actually not I think there's a big issue as well I think it's a little bit ironic of like the one thing you do want the SEC to do is the thing they're not doing. And then yet they'll overstep on everything else. <laughs> so here's the history of the SEC. The first project they ever went after was not the abundant scams in the crypto community. Where the, I mean, it, the crypto community in the early days, like there were all kinds of scams flying around. There still are, right? The SEC didn't focus on them. They focused on Satoshi Dice, which was an incredibly popular gaming platform, a gambling <laughs> platform. They focused on that and wanted to shut down that. So like they weren't going after frauds. They weren't trying to protect people. They were going after success. And that's what drives me crazy about the whole, you know, institution is that they're going after library, a decentralized video platform that's providing awesome things. Like where were they when one coin was abundant and you had like these, you know, main, like affiliate marketers who were just pushing this thing with this, this scam artist who walked away with billions of dollars of people's money where they they literally were locking up people's money and not letting them take it out but meanwhile just like arbitrarily increasing their balance so people think that oh they're earning money and no one could ever get their money out like that's an outright scam mm -hmm. where was the sec when that was going down so they are they are not the people that we should have in charge of this industry deciding like who to protect us from because they have routinely made the wrong choices all the way down the line i just think what they've done is atrocious and they've stifled innovation. They've hurt amazing companies. They've hurt users who have you know, lost access to certain airdrops and things that, that, you know, American citizens are not allowed to get access to. I think that's crazy. And uh, I just, I have such, a, I, I'm so resentful of them. Now, I might be misrepresenting it because I read the book back in college, but uh, I believe the SEC was actually created or first headed by uh, JFK's father. And the reason he got that position was because he was funding the current president, but he made his money from manipulating the market. And then, so the president, like that was his commentary. He's like, well, the best way to catch him is hiring someone who did it. And that's actually how the Kennedys made all their money. And he was the first head of the SEC way back when. He like manipulates, is, like it's so that makes wild. so much sense to me. <laughs> that's it's perfect. awesome. Like it, it's just crazy. And it's like you said, it's a bureaucratic institution and this is kind of what we get for it. To wrap it all up, one of the biggest things I get of with this is because obviously there are scams and there are unfortunately nefarious actors in this world. Mm -hmm. And your expertise is very much in alignment with crypto and privacy. What is the best way for everyone listening to this, watching this, to protect themselves in the world of crypto? 
Yeah, it's really tough. I mean, I mean this latest hack that, that's happened and uh, like people are looking at Solana and saying, oh, Solana's terrible. They, they were using wallets that were custodial or whatever. Um, that's actually not it. It was actually just one wallet that wasn't custodial, but was just badly written code that was literally leaking people's seed phrases and that, you know, crypto could then get hacked. Like you have things like that all the time where, you know, people are moving past and breaking things and they're creating new products and people are diving in because they're seeing, oh, 20% APY, that's mm -hmm. awesome. Let me get on that. Or, you know, I'm being conservative. So yeah. <laughs> 50 million AP, <laughs> APY. Um, I would say just be careful. Now, this is an exciting world and the ethos in the early days, you don't really hear people say this much anymore, but I used to tell people years and years ago, like don't invest more than you're willing to lose because we don't know what's gonna happen with this world. There are bugs in code and all of this. And I have even changed that mentality now because I think that a lot of this stuff has proven itself to be really robust and interesting. So now it's a matter of just deciding your own risk parameters and you're know, putting in the amount that you're, you're comfortable with. Um, but not from the perspective of this could crash at any moment, you know, just like be discerning. But there are all, all of these new products being developed every day that I think you have to be really discerning with. Um, mm -hmm. And it's hard for the average person. We're not all developers who are able to look at this code and find bugs and all that. So there's a lot of trust in this industry. You're relying on people to vet this stuff. You're relying on a lot of people to have a lot of eyes on this bug. I mean, for th there was this outrageous bug. Uh, I think it was an SSL encryption years ago. It was a heart bleed or, or something. Uh, mm. Maybe your audience can correct me if I'm wrong, but that went, that's an open source thing that's been around for, for forever, uh, open source code base. And and no one discovered this atrocious bug that was there, even with all these eyes looking at it. So the moral of the story is that open source is necessary, but it's not sufficient to protect you. Just because something can be vetted doesn't mean that it is being vetted. So you should be careful. I try to just look to the people that I know are really pedantic about this stuff and mm -hmm. really are looking into it themselves. And I try to follow their lead uh, because I know that I don't have the skill set or time to be doing this, you know, this work on my own. So finding people in the community that you trust, um, people who, you know, aren't just jumping on a bandwagon or pumping their own bags or whatever, just like really seek out your crowd of people that, that you think are trustworthy and, uh, and be you careful, be judicious, be careful when you're installing plugins in your browser, like wallets that say, oh, well, it's just a, it's just an extension. I'll just download this wallet extension. It'll be fine. Understand that every time you give something permission to read and change anything in your browser, you've literally given them the keys to the kingdom. So if you don't trust that developer, if it only has one user, if you don't know anything about it, do not install these extensions. Mm -hmm. You know, do not download wallet software on your computer if you don't know where it came from. Be careful with software that you're engaging with because it, it's a dangerous world out there and crypto is lucrative and there are people who are targeting crypto users with phishing attacks, with, you know, um, uh, hacking and getting ad addresses online. If you're buying something from Ledger or whatever, you know, use a VoIP number, use a PO box. Don't mm -hmm. put your home address on this stuff. Like just start to be more cautious because this industry, I think, is only going to get better. Uh, it's only going to get bigger. Um, it's going to get more and more exciting, but it's also going to that target on its back is going to get bigger and bigger. And people need to start to learn how to protect themselves online and have good security hygiene. Well, in terms of an actionable item that the audience could take right now, are you personally a fan of going right to a hardware wallet or are you using a cold wallet or are you fine with hot wallets as long as you trust the developer? Like what's something that they could do right now to protect themselves a little bit more? Okay. So, all right. So a couple of things to do with like privacy. There are probably a lot of you out there who are using crypto thinking you're flying under the radar because you're mixing or you no, you never associated your name with a wallet. Um, so understand how privacy leaks work. For example, every time you open your wallet and it's giving you the amount of Litecoin in there and the amount of US dollars that that equals, how is it getting that information? Well, it's pinging some API that is giving it that information. So there are all kinds of leaks that happen where, you know, if someone's on the receiving end of that API, maybe it's like, maybe it's actually a honeypot or whatever. Mm -hmm. Or maybe that company gets subpoenaed. Suddenly they have access to everyone who has been pinging, you know, that like that currency 
from this IP address and, and associated with like, you know, the blocks that populate. The, the reason you can see in your wallet um, with the amount that you have is because it's, you know, pinging the blockchain and saying like, look up these blocks and, mm. uh, and these transactions and tell me, you know, the amounts associated with that. That stuff is all data that does get collected. Every time you go to a block explorer online and you type in like, check this transaction ID, it's been shown that a lot of these block explorer sites are honeypots. And so that data is then collected and suddenly your IP address again is associated with a certain, you know, wallet, uh, certain block, certain like transaction ID. All of this stuff gets linked. So I think that it's a journey. It's not something that you can just like have a quick fix. But I would say just start to familiarize yourself with some of the ways that data leakage happens. Start to protect yourself. It's not just like, I'm not just talking about like government agents might come <laughs> after you for tax reasons or whatever. Totally a feasible scenario, by the way. But also hackers might be monitoring these things, trying to figure out like who has crypto. Just like be aware of this stuff um, and take it slowly. The first actionable items you can do, I would say if you have a large amount of crypto, um, a hard hardware wallet is a great idea for that. It, just keeping that offline is is important. If you have stuff that you use every day, I think that you know a couple hundred dollars on a phone is fine. And the, the system I use to gauge this is how much money would I be comfortable walking around with in my wallet. I wouldn't be comfortable walking around with you know, a few thousand dollars in my wallet. That's like, oh, that, that's uncomfortable. So I would sort your crypto assets the same way. Um, and I would just start to learn about masking protocols or things that you could do to protect your identity. So whether it's not you know, um, associating your phone number as a unique identifier on your social media account, as well as your bank account, as well as your you know, <laughs> crypto wallet, as well as your, like, like this stuff is all available on the dark web. It's, mm -hmm. it's all available. All all of your information, if I were to search for anyone's you know, email address or whatever, you end up with a treasure trove of information with personally identifiable mm -hmm. things that have been linked to that identifier. So yeah, just start to be aware of this stuff and take proactive measures to protect yourself is, is really important. And we don't like to do it, it's hard, it's difficult to wrap our heads around, we think it's not gonna affect us um, until it does. But when it does, it could turn your life upside down and it's better just to take small steps now to protect yourself. Yeah, uh, definitely a little bit scary, but I think those are some awesome tips uh, to wrap this Don't up. Don't like scare your audience. I just totally, I was just like, everyone be careful. <laughs> and you're like, oh, that's a terrifying note to go out on. I it's mean, not that bad. Like, it's better to be scared and save way. their money than like getting caught on the other way around. So I, I still think <laughs> it's awesome information. Um, I'll make sure to get your, your Twitter, your YouTube and your website in the description of the video. Uh, if people have questions and they want to follow up, what's the best way for them to reach out to you? Oh gosh, um, YouTube, I read every single comment okay. on there. So feel free if there's something that you have a question about, let me know. Twitter, I'm also checking all the time. Um, and Odyssey, if you're on there, if you're not on there, sign up. You actually get money for, um, for watching videos on there. So it's pretty cool. That's awesome. Well, I truly appreciate your time. Thank you so much. We'll be talking soon. And hopefully we can do a little bit of a follow up after the SEC library protocol case. And hopefully we're having a little bit of champagne in those party poppers. But once again, so. thank you for your time and we'll be talking soon. Thanks so much. Have a good one.